Why are you here? I don't mean wherever you are watching this video. I mean philosophically. Why are any of us here? What is the point of anything? To put it another way, what is the meaning of life? It's a question humans have been asking for about as long as we've been able to put the idea to words. Not what are we doing, but why? It doesn't take a professional philosopher to consider the question. Just about everybody at some point in their lives wonders about the purpose of existence. Countless artists have grappled with this issue in their work, and it's everywhere in modern pop culture. Some movies take a serious, emotional approach to the subject, like Seven Pounds or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Others have a sillier take, like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is... But no film I've seen in years comes close to addressing these ideas with the same level of nuance, creativity, and style as everything, everywhere, all at once. The film is inventive and bold, astoundingly original, funny, and captures the inherent madness of infinite realities far better than other recent films. And unlike most movies with such an ambitious premise, Everything Everywhere never loses sight of its emotional and thematic core, which is all about finding meaning and purpose in a vast and uncaring universe. And although this isn't a movie I think it would even be possible to ruin simply by talking about the plot or characters, there will be major spoilers for Everything Everywhere all at once throughout this video. If you haven't seen it yet, please consider yourself warned because we're about to go on an epic quest to escape the black hole of nihilism and find the meaning of life on this episode of Out of Frame. Let me go ahead and get this out right up front. Everything Everywhere All at Once, written and directed by Dan Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, is probably the best movie I've seen all year. It stars Michelle Yeoh and Stephanie Hsu as the mother and daughter pair Evelyn and Joy. When we meet them, along with Evelyn's husband, Waymond, they're a disconnected, broken family who owns a laundromat and is currently being audited by the IRS. Their whole life, according to Evelyn, is just one endless, monotonous loop of laundry and taxes. She's frustrated and unhappy. Her attitude causes all sorts of rifts with her family. She's short, dismissive, and unaffectionate towards Waymond, to the extent that he's actually contemplating divorce. She's confused by and ashamed of her daughter Joy, both for being sort of rudderless, which reminds Evelyn of the disappointment she feels for her own mediocrity, and also for being a lesbian, which is something that Evelyn struggles to understand and tolerate thanks to her Chinese cultural upbringing. Mostly, though, she just feels like nothing is quite the way it should be. She isn't the person she should be. And she can't understand why her husband isn't as depressed and stressed out as she is. In spite of everything, somehow he's constantly upbeat and nice to everyone. On the way to a meeting with their IRS auditor, who has won prestigious awards for her work making life harder for taxpayers, something insane happens. Evelyn meets a version of Waymond from an alternate reality. He tells her about the possibilities of the multiverse and believes that she is the version of herself that just might be able to defeat the near-omnipotent creature Jobu Topaki that's currently threatening the existence of every universe. It turns out that another version of Evelyn discovered a method of identifying alternate universes and hopping from one to another by inhabiting the consciousness of the version of herself that lives there. This power gives the hopper access to whatever knowledge and skills the other version of themselves has. So if they're a powerful martial artist, you can fight. If they're a chef, you can cook. If they have hot dogs for fingers, you, yeah. Unfortunately, this technique is dangerous, and if it goes wrong, it can result in the universe hopper experiencing every version of themselves at once, which could potentially drive them insane. This is what happened to Jobu Topaki. Jobu is able to access every version of herself in every universe, all at once. 
but that power forced her to gaze into the abyss, and when it gazed back at her, her tether to reality broke. And as she discovers that she can be everything, everywhere, all at once, existence loses all meaning. So Jobu, this ultra-powerful, multiversal being who can do basically anything she wants, decides to make an everything bagel, which becomes a singularity with the potential to completely unravel reality. I got bored one day when I put everything on a bagel. Everything. All my hopes and dreams, my old report cards. And it collapsed in on itself. Because <laughs> you see, when you really put everything on a bagel, it becomes this, the truth. What is the truth? Nothing matters. This everything bagel of nothingness is an incredible metaphor for nihilism as a concept. Jobu, despite all her incredible knowledge and power, cannot find the one thing that makes life worth living, meaning. And because she can't find that one thing, she figures that she might as well end it all. And not just for herself, but for everyone in every universe. Nothing matters, so why keep any of it around? In short, she has discovered both the root and the ultimate consequence of her nihilistic worldview. Death. Oh, and by the way, Jobu Topaki is an alternate version of Evelyn's daughter, Joy. But before we get into why that's thematically important, let's talk a little bit more about her ideas. Nihilism is a philosophy that rejects the idea that there's any such thing as objective truth or morality. It holds that life is fundamentally meaningless. Even such notions as right and wrong are basically fictions we tell ourselves to help us sleep at night. Right is a tiny box invented by people who are afraid. And I know what it feels like to be trapped inside that box. Oh. Ugh. If you've heard me talk about nihilism before on this show, you'll know that I'm not a fan. But I do think I have a sense of why so many people seem to be slipping into the same dark place that turned joy into Jobu Topaki. Humans, as a species, are unique in that we have the capacity for a significant degree of self-reflection. All animals are, by nature, self-interested. They have to be in order to survive and thrive in a reality which requires them to work and consume resources for survival. But humans actually think about ourselves and reflect on our needs in ways that other animals can't. We ponder existence and question our place in the universe. And for most of our history, people have felt like they were the center of the universe and that everything exists for our own benefit. But as our knowledge and understanding of how the world works has expanded, it's become more and more evident that this just isn't true. Objectively, we're not the center of the universe at all. And the more scientific mysteries we solve, the smaller and more insignificant our species appears to be. But as ascension species, we need that feeling of significance for our lives to mean something. Many people, the majority around the world, find comfort and purpose in belief in a higher power that is actively watching over them. They get solace and meaning from the divine. But the number of religious people, particularly here in the United States, is dropping. And with more people abandoning religious faith, or like me, never having had it in the first place, it isn't surprising that they look elsewhere to find comfort and purpose in the face of an impossibly large and unfeeling cosmos. Unfortunately, if you fail to find a suitable replacement for the meaning that was historically provided by religion, you could end up in an incredibly dark place. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. That's certainly one way to look at things. I get it. It's hard to keep a positive attitude towards life and even just doing the right thing when it feels like nobody else is. It's hard to keep taking responsibility for yourself. It's hard to be a person, let alone a good one. And it sure seems like it's a lot easier to just let the everything bagel of nihilism consume you. For someone like Evelyn, who feels completely useless already, it's a major temptation. Feels nice, doesn't it? If 
nothing matters, then all the pain and guilt you feel for making nothing of your life goes away. All your faults, failings, and insecurities can be absolved, and you don't have to do anything to fix them because there's nothing to fix. There is no right or wrong, no good or bad, so there's nothing to ever feel bad about. Nothing matters, including the pain you cause yourself and others through your own actions. Right? No. This is a trap. If life is meaningless and there's nothing to feel bad about, there's also nothing to feel good about. And as much as the philosophy pretends to be profound, nihilism doesn't result in the absence of feeling anyway. It's not actually nothingness. It's sadness and depression. It's loneliness and disconnection. People who adopt a nihilistic worldview don't become devoid of guilt or learn to manage their feelings effectively. They just end up feeling confused, untethered, and awful. Paraphrasing Nietzsche, when they gaze into the abyss, it gazes right back at them, and they become worse versions of themselves. In Everything Everywhere All at Once, Evelyn is basically a blank slate. She doesn't really know who she is, feeling a general sense of disappointment in herself and her life, always wondering if she could have made different choices. She has a tremendous fear of missing out that ultimately takes her away from everything that's actually happening around her. She ignores Waymond. She is bitter about the laundromat. And for all the time and effort she puts into it, she's not even very good at getting her receipts in order for the IRS. In the words of alternate universe Waymond, There is no way I am the Evelyn you are looking for. I'm no good at anything. Exactly. I've seen thousands of Evelyns. But never an Evelyn like you. You have so many goals you never finished. Dreams you never followed. You're living your worst you. I can't be the worst. What about that hot dog one? Evelyn has to decide who she wants to be. And while the multiverse theoretically allows for infinite possibilities, there are fundamentally only two choices Evelyn can make find meaning, or reject life altogether. This is the choice confronting all of us, and it's ultimately what the film is about. And one of the greatest things about Everything Everywhere All at Once is how clearly these two paths are represented by its core characters. While Evelyn doesn't really know who she is or what she feels, Jobu, Joy, comes to the conclusion that in the face of all the pain and guilt and misery in the multiverse, nothing really means anything. And because she believes there's no meaning to life, she can do whatever she wants, whenever she wants, to anyone she wants, regardless of their interpretation of what is meaningful. And the things she does while in the grip of her nihilism don't just affect her. She hurts and kills other people without remorse. But her purpose in the story is not just to be a villain. It's also to embody one path for Evelyn to potentially follow. Meanwhile, her husband Waymond represents the alternative. Waymond, basically all versions of him, as far as I can tell, is the opposite of Jobu Tupaki. He is happy, positive, and kind, proactive, constructive, and he works to find joy and meaning in the little things. He chooses to create meaning for himself instead of abandoning all hope in the face of adversity. And in the turn to act three of the film, one of the coolest versions of Waymond helps Evelyn see that this is his greatest strength. You the one wrong, right? 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 This is a very cold world. We are in the house. This I understand. You and I have been on this earth for so long. I know you're all fighting because you're scared and confused. 我总是看到事情好的一面，那不是因为我天真，而是必要，而需要。The only thing I do know is that we have to be kind. Please be kind, especially when we don't know what's going on. 我理解当你不是一个服输的人
，我又何尝不是？只是我们选择的处理方式不一样。Hey Evelyn, bagel. This choice between Jobu Tapaki and Waymond is the core of the entire film. Will Evelyn sink into the nihilistic bagel of nothingness, or will she find meaning in her actions and relationships? The philosophy Evelyn decides to accept makes all the difference to the outcome of her story and to her life. And it's the same choice we all have to make for ourselves. You only need to turn on the news these days to see how the nihilistic attitude plays out in real life. Violence, theft, drug overdoses, despair, isolation, senseless, pointless brutality. A shocking percentage of young people struggle with depression and self-harm, and I suspect a lot of that comes from feeling a lack of meaning and purpose in their lives. We seem to have lost that as a culture. Some people will tell you that the answer is religion, but the thing of it is, you can find meaning in life even if you don't believe in any kind of higher power. I know you can because I don't, and I've done it. And this ultimately is the real lesson of everything, everywhere, all at once. We can choose what matters in our lives. We can choose to find meaning in people and relationships. We can choose to find meaning in our creativity and our work. We can even choose to find meaning in the worst kinds of suffering. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. He lost his first wife, both his parents, and his brother to various Nazi concentration camps. And he wrote his first book, *Man's Search for Meaning*, over the course of nine days. While he himself was in a concentration camp, in it he wrote, "If there is meaning in life at all, then there must be meaning in suffering." From someone who had lost and endured so much, our much smaller problems can seem trivial, but Frankel has something to say about that too. A man's suffering is similar to the behavior of a gas. If a certain quantity of gas is pumped into an empty chamber, it will fill the chamber completely and evenly, no matter how big the chamber. Thus, suffering completely fills the human soul and conscious mind, no matter whether the suffering is great or little. Therefore, the size of human suffering is absolutely relative. Pain and hardship are universal, but I still think it's worth keeping things in perspective. Whatever pain and hardship you're experiencing is probably not a Nazi death camp. That doesn't make whatever you might be dealing with less real. But it can be helpful to know that other people have endured much worse, and it can help to feel a sense of gratitude for what's still going right. Learning to appreciate what you have can help you find meaning, and that's going to be the thing that sustains you through the hard times in life. As I said in the previous episode, there is such a thing as good and evil, and I'm telling you this time that there is meaning to life. It's just that we have to hunt it down and hold on to it for ourselves. For me, meaning comes from my work, from the sense of purpose I get in talking about these kinds of ideas with other people. Meaning comes from my relationships with my wife, my family, my friends. It comes from creating things, building things, and contributing something new to the world that didn't exist before I got here. And it comes from maintaining a perspective on humanity and human history that values the immense hardship endured by my ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years, and the civilization that they built, which now provides me with luxuries they could have never imagined. Humanity's ingenuity, productivity, and capacity to create is astounding, and it helps me see that I am a part of something much bigger and much more meaningful than just myself. With or without any kind of religious beliefs, Jobu Tapaki, Joy forgets all of this. Heck, even Evelyn forgets this. Evelyn neglects her relationships with her husband, her daughter, her father, her customers, and yes, with her IRS auditor. And it's only by coming back to them and remembering why she does all this laundry and all these taxes in the first place that she can show this meaning to Jobu and bring her back to Joy. And in the end, she chooses to follow Wayman's path of fighting her depression with kindness, and finds meaning in her choices and in her family. She rejects Joe Butapaki's worldview, finally seeing human existence as the miracle it really is, and not just a random byproduct of physics. And I really hope you'll try to do the same. 
Hey everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Out of Frame. Before you go, I have some big news that I wanted to share with everyone. In just about three months, this series is coming to an end. I know that will be a shock to a lot of you, and I can't tell you how grateful I am to have built such a wonderful audience over the last five years. But for those who haven't seen my announcements on the Behind the Scenes podcast and on Discord, I'm no longer the creative director at Fee. My new job is going to require me to spend a lot of time creating film and video content for other clients, and I'll be working on a bunch of exciting new projects, so I just won't have time to do this show anymore. I will be helping Fee come up with some great ideas for series that I hope you'll all still really love, and we'll be experimenting with a few of those before I'm gone, so please stick around and give whatever comes next a chance. In the meantime, I want to thank all of our supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar, and invite everyone to join our Discord. Feel free to ask me any questions there or in the comments, and I'll try to get back to you. I'll share more details as they come, and you'll know when it's the actual final episode. But just know that I appreciate every single one of you for watching this series all these years. See you next time.